In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, last Sunday was a bit of a different arrangement because I was ready to go and had my sermon ready and then I wasn't allowed to go because we'd had a gentleman come into the pantry who was turned out, we learned afterwards, was positive with COVID. So I, along with Moy and a few other people, have had to lie low, as it were. So Camellia stepped in and not only preached on Sunday, but also went out to Lawrence. So, so this is the sermon I would have given had I, had I been here on Sunday morning. And I want to focus on that story about the blind person at Jericho. And I want to pick up the idea of sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. That's an expression we're familiar with. And it means, of course, that we're so um, captivated and engrossed by the details in front of us that we don't see the bigger picture. We don't see the larger reality of which that particular item is but one part. And so we have this saying in English that goes back at least to the 16th century when we first have a, an example of it in the literature of people saying, oh, that person can't see the forest for the trees. Or I think of the original version, couldn't see the wood for the trees. But it's been around for a long time. Well, the tree in today's reading, if you like, is the blind beggar, a guy called Bartimaeus. And we get his name twice, in effect, because Bartimaeus is just the Aramaic for son of Timaeus. And Mark says, his name was Bartimaeus, he was the son of Timaeus, I guess. Hello, Mark, we've got it. Okay, we know who this guy is, although we'll never hear about him ever again in terms of the Gospels. And I'm sure many sermons last Sunday were preached about this, this interesting character, a minor character, not for him, <laughs> pretty big day for him in his life, but a minor character in the, in the Gospels. And in, and in focusing on, the, on just this one episode of one particular blind man being healed, it's easy to miss the forest. And that's a forest which Mark, the evangelist, has been carefully growing and tending in the background as he tells his story. So I want us to zoom out a little bit, sort of stand back so we can see the, see the larger picture. We're almost at the end of a year which we have spent in church listening to Mark. Next year we'll focus on Luke. Last year we focused on Matthew. But this year is what we call the year of Mark. And we've particularly in the Gospels through the year, we've listened to the way Mark tells the Jesus story. So what have we learned? What's the forest? Okay. Can we see the Markan forest? So the gospel according to Mark, as we call it, we, in shorthand we say Mark's gospel, but it's correctly, it's the, the gospel, there's only one gospel, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel the way Mark tells it. He seems to have been the very first of those four gospels which are included in the New Testament, the very first to be written. And in doing that, he did something no one had ever done in the early church before him. There's no evidence that Paul, for example, ever tried to teach people the story of Jesus and tell them the parables and tell them of various things he'd done. Mark was the first person, so far as we know, who did that. And we don't even know that his name was Mark, but we call him Mark, so let's just keep doing that. So he was doing this fairly, and it was a unique piece of uh, project, in a sense. He's doing it somewhere in the last quarter of the first century, which means it's after the Romans have totally destroyed Jerusalem, demolished the temple, and the Jewish community has been scattered more than it had been for several hundred years. And that's the background as well to what Mark is saying about Jesus. When he tells his story about Jesus, he puts it in the context of what's just happened in the politics of the Roman Empire. And the story that Mark tells became the basic storyline for both Matthew and Luke when each of them, some decades later, 
you know, did their own version of the Jesus story. But Mark's story is actually different from theirs in a number of ways. And most interestingly, it has no Christmas stories. Mark doesn't go there. He just starts with Jesus as an adult getting baptised by John and the story goes on from there. So that's a bit different. And the other big difference from Mark is there's not really an Easter story. We have an empty tomb and we have a few women that are freaked out by speaking with what may have been an angel, but we don't get, we don't get the Easter appearances in Mark either. So Mark clearly has his own way of telling the story and he, he's leaving a lot of loose ends up in the air. But on the way through, and one way of making sense of what Mark is doing is that as he tells his story, he's got two big questions for his readers. Who was Jesus and how do we follow him? Okay, two big questions. During the first half of his document, from chapter one till about halfway through chapter eight, Mark develops the idea that, well, in a way, Jesus is like a turbocharged version of both Moses and Elijah rolled into the one package. He tells stories where Jesus is like Moses, only bigger. He tells stories where Moses is like Elijah, only more spectacular. Moses for the covenant legacy and Elijah for the prophetic, powerful ministry of Jesus. So the, if you like the best of the old, Moses and Elijah, it's all there in Jesus, but a whole lot more as well. So, and by the time we get to that turning point in the gospel, Mark has Jesus saying to the disciples, so who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some think you're Elijah and some think you're John the Baptist. And then he said, but who do you think I am? So that's kind of the first half of the gospel. The second half, more or less, from what's left of chapter 8 through to the beginning of chapter 16, um, kind of falls into two bits. The last bit is Jesus in Jerusalem, and it's very much about the conflict between Jesus and the temple authorities. But in between, there's a section about discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? And we find that through the part of chapter 8, all of chapter 9, all of chapter 10, and our passage this morning is the final episode in that section. So we end up with a passage in the middle, kind of in the middle of Mark, if you like it's the third quarter of Mark, where we have two blind men that get to see and we have 12 sighted men who fumble about and don't know where they're going. So that section begins and ends with Jesus healing a blind man. In between times, Jesus is dealing with a bunch of disciples who just don't get it. We might say they don't see it. They have eyes but nothing appears to be working. So it opens with this strange scene, which is at Bethsaida, and some of you will know that's where I dig, that's where I work on the archeology span dig in Israel. The story of Bethsaida, where they bring a blind person to Jesus and ask him to heal the man, nothing unusual. Normally Jesus would just say, you're good to go, mate, or something like that. Your faith has made you well, on your way. But this time, he takes the blind fellow by the hand, takes him outside the village to a private place. He bends down and gets some dirt from the ground and spits on it and makes a bit of a paste, puts it on the guy's eyes and says, how's that? And famously, the man says, well, I can see, but look, people look like trees walking around. In other words, <laughs> everything's fuzzy. I can sort of see, but I can't see clearly. So Jesus looks intently at the man, lays his hands on him, and this time the man is able to see properly, and Jesus says, don't go back in the village, just go home. You're done. 
And through the rest of the next couple of chapters, Jesus is traveling with a bunch of disciples who kind of see who Jesus is, but don't really see clearly. They're lacking clarity. They don't really have insight. Over and over again through those three chapters, Jesus talks about the cost and the nature of discipleship and the 12 never get it. At no stage do they get it. Mark even has Jesus tell them three times. It's, it's roughly chapter 8, verse 31, chapter 9, verse 33, and round about the same point in chapter 10, round about verse 33, 35. Jesus says to them, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem, he's going to be beaten and killed, and on the third day he will rise. And then they come to Jericho, which is their last stop before Jerusalem. And another blind man pops into the story. Bartimaeus is excited to hear that Jesus is passing by. And when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He's very clear. I want to see again. No more mud paste this time. Jesus simply assures him that his own faith has made him well and he can go. But what happens? He doesn't go. He stays. And typical Mark, Mark's favourite word is immediately. He uses it, you know, I don't know, 40 or whatever number of times in the Gospel. And so Mark says, immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And the way is, of course, the way of discipleship, the way of the cross, the way, the road to Jerusalem. So can we see the forest and not just the tree? Bartimaeus does not go home, but he walks the way of Jesus. He follows the way of the cross. We could twist things a little bit by saying he's the first person to walk the Via Dolorosa even before Jesus does it. He's following Jesus on the way of the cross. Finally, Jesus has a disciple who sees clearly, who understands what's involved and is willing to follow him to Jerusalem. Now we never hear of Bartimaeus again. He's not mentioned at the Last Supper. He's not mentioned in the book of Acts. But he's one of those characters who passes across our line of sight and is the very model of discipleship. Unlike the disciples and the other interested inquirers in the previous three chapters, he doesn't ask to keep his wealth, like the rich young ruler. He doesn't seek a powerful role in the kingdom of God, like um, James and John. He doesn't ask Jesus to wait while he goes and buries his father and tidies up a few personal affairs first. He doesn't ask Jesus to wait while he sorts out his investment portfolio. He doesn't try to push the others out of the way so he can get first place and be greatest in the kingdom. He doesn't criticise people who think or believe differently and say, hey Jesus, can we call down fire and destroy these people? Because they're not joining our group. Bartimaeus simply follows Jesus in the way. He sees what he has to do and he does it. That is the forest, isn't it? To be a disciple is to be somebody who walks the way of Jesus. And all that we've experienced and learned during this past year as we've been listening to the Gospel of Mark is for this one simple purpose. Can we now see more clearly that the one thing which matters is whether we choose to walk the way of Jesus? And so as we come to the table of Jesus in a few minutes, as we come for communion, we're saying, yes, I'm choosing to walk the way of Jesus. Amen.